Hey guys, it's Laptop Laura, and this is Copy That Pops. Writing tips and psychology hacks applied to online biz success. Whoa, oh, oh, here we go. Our guest today is an award-winning Filipino-American entrepreneur who has over a decade of experience building, aka bootstrapping, I love that, Amazing. and operating six and seven figure online businesses. He and his businesses have been featured in magazines such as Entrepreneur, Forbes, the Boston Globe, and other top publications. And in his free time, Ray Blakeney, our guest, is a part-time sword fighter. That's right. Okay, let's just start with the sword fighting. Forget this whole psychology. Yeah, the whole business stuff is boring. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell us about sword fighting. So I've been practicing a Japanese martial art called kendo for going on about 20 years now. Wow. It is Japanese fencing. I just say sword fighting because most people would understand it better that way. <laughs> I'll admit, ever since I was a kid, I've always been fascinated by the Japanese culture. You know, I grew up in Turkey, and the only cartoons we had were, for some reason, Japanese cartoons, but, you know, dubbed in Turkish. So those old anime, like the, huh, I know the name in Spanish, from the Knights of the Zodiac or something like that. So I kind of grew up watching that stuff. So I always thought sword fighting was really cool. Star Wars, all the rest of it. Um, then when I got to about... My teenage years, I started trying martial arts, and then I didn't even know kendo existed. It's like this weird, random martial art out there. And I just tried one for six months, and like I tried one, and then I just stumbled across a kendo dojo when I was in the U.S. in college. Loved it. And I have and where was been that? practicing. This was in Ohio, back in the, in the U.S. I studied at a university called Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. They gave me a full-ride scholarship. Oh, I was going mean, to say, was, what the heck? Cause yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. You are born in the Philippines, grew Correct. up in Turkey. You went got to it. college in Ohio, uh -huh. Peace Corps in Mexico, where you met your wife, your, your now wife, and uh -huh. are still in Mexico now, but might have some more adventures in the future. We're hoping Southeast Asia comes next. Uh, in the next two or three years, that's our plan. That's so cool. I love yeah. that. I, I and love sword fighting the whole way. I mean, I, I practiced sword the, fighting around the globe. Oh, I'm, I've already have. I practiced in Thailand earlier this year. I'm going to Australia in six weeks. I'm going to practice with a dojo down there as well. Great way to people meet locals. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, you're going to Australia to speak at We Are Podcast, right? That's right, where you spoke last year. <laughs> yes, and I would love to this year, but oh, being a new mom has definitely been, I want to say harder than I expected, but I don't mean to make it like a negative, but it's mm -hmm. definitely been more all-encompassing than I had anticipated. So, As yeah, a fellow think, new parent, I can yeah. definitely relate. I mean, you know, like you, we read the books. Right. We knew what we were getting into. I mean, my wife and I are older. We're in our late 30s. So it's not mm -hmm. like, you know, oops, this happened by accident. Right, I mean, right. you know, we knew exactly it was a conscious decision for us <laughs> to do it. And everybody says, It'll, you know, you won't have any free time. It'll change your life. And I'm like, how hard could it be? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a lot harder. <laughs> a lot of my so respect, a lot harder than running my multiple businesses. I mean, right. you know, having a child is, and we even have help at home, but it's still a lot harder having yeah. a child than it is running and building a business. <laughs> now, some people listening might be like, no, I don't agree with you Help me with the business stuff. So, okay. So let's lay a little bit of foundation. So the first business that you started with your wife as your business partner mm -hmm. was Live Lingua. So paint the picture for us. How old are you? And you're in Mexico just after doing the Peace Corps-ish? Yeah. So the, the first business, which became Live Lingua that we launched was right after I finished the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. My wife... I always wanted to run a business, but I realized early on that like my skill set, I was a computer engineer by training, so I knew how to write software and all the rest. And I learned a little bit of management skills because I was a team lead for a while. But my skills were great to be a consultant. They weren't really something to build a business around. At least mm. I, I couldn't think of a way to build a business around it. I had like these complementary skills for businesses. I met my wife and we started chatting while we were still dating that she always wanted to launch a Spanish school. She's a Spanish teacher and she wanted to launch a brick and mortar Spanish school. So we decided to get married and I, we talked about it and we're like, okay, look, we're in our late twenties. We don't have very many, much money, but worst case scenario, you're a bilingual teacher. I'm a computer engineer. We'll get jobs. I mean, you know, we'll be able to find work. Why don't we give it a shot? You know, we have no other responsibility right now. So we had $2,500 in the bank account. So when I say bootstrapping, it wasn't quite zero, but literally that was for us to live off of and launch our business. Yeah. And this and is so like 2008, 2008, oh, 2008 okay. mm -hmm. I think 2008. Yeah, that sounds about right. So Peace Corps was 2006, 2008. We finished. I used the $2,500 I had was the money the Peace Corps gives you to kind of fly back to the US oh. and, you know, maybe buy a bed <laughs> so you can start your life over there. But we decided to use that to start a business. We also used that money to get married. So we got married in the building where we launched our first school, which was a small historic home in the downtown in a city called Queretaro, Mexico. 
we couldn't afford furniture, so we had this inflatable mattress that we bought new, but it even had a hole in it. So we would fall asleep on the mattress at night, and we would wake up in the morning on the Aww. floor because by then it would be totally out. We'd roll it up and throw it under one desk, and that would be my office desk, and the students would come to the school. Wow. We got lucky. At that time, I stumbled across something called SEO, search engine optimization. This is back in 2008. So not that many people were doing it. No other Spanish school in Mexico even knew the concept existed. Mm. So the month we launched, if you looked for a Spanish school in Mexico, we were number one. And a lot of people think that if you're number one in Google, you must be the best, right? right, that's, that's right. No correlation at all. We, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but we hadn't even opened yet and we were number one in Google. So we were fully booked within six weeks. And so, but luckily a lot of people wanted to pay up front because we all, uh -huh, you know, you uh -huh. ask for a deposit and the rest when you arrive. But a lot of it was like, people just said, I want to pay and I don't want to worry about it. Yeah. We would run out this day they paid and we'd buy furniture. We'd kind of go and put the furniture in the classroom. So oh, by the time incredible. they showed up a week later, we actually had a classroom for them and we were scrambling. It was a great time. We that's loved amazing. it. That's amazing. I love that. Six months into it, swine flu hit Mexico. So we were full and suddenly swine flu hits Mexico. For those, this is kind of apropos for the time we're in, you know, with the coronavirus over in China. Right. It was the equivalent of Mexico. And everybody was thinking about quarantining the country. Nobody was coming here. And we needed to look for a way, not only for the school to survive, but for our teachers to make money because mm -hmm. they would work week for week. We'd pay them well, much more than any other local school. So we were able to get the best teachers. But the problem is budgeting, just like in the United money. States. Yeah. Exactly. Like, it's not like, a big thing. Yeah. Anywhere else in the world, they would we would pay them on Friday. By the next Friday, they'd be gone. I tried one, I went to pay them once a month. And my wife, who was in the Spanish, you know, she had experience. She's like, no, no teacher will accept that. We need to pay every Friday for that week's work because wow. that's what they're going to use for the next seven days. Yeah. So we needed to look for an option for them to make money, but some of them had kids and had to support their family. So we had the idea of why don't we just contact our previous students? And try to give them classes on Skype. Again, this is 2008. So Nobody smart. was doing this. And this was your wife's idea, I think. This I was heard, my wife's yeah. idea, exactly. Totally I like was her, her Laura. Exactly. It's her name Laura. as well. Yeah, same as, same smart. as you. Smart. So. Tocayas, they would say in Mexico, right? That's why you call people with the same name. So Tocayas or toca Tocayo. Oh. So if somebody with Raymond would be Tocayo for me. And <laughs> so I, computer engineer, I put up a really awful page. I mean, it was really bad. I'm not a graphic designer. And, it, you know, it's called Spanish-Lessons-Online.com. And we threw it up there. It looked awful, did basic SEO on it. And we started ranking for the word Skype Spanish lessons. Very easy because nobody else was trying to rank for mm -hmm. it. Within six months, we were making more money than we were at our school, just from the Spanish lessons. Swine flu died in three weeks. I mean, a month yeah. later, we were fully booked against where our school was there. But within six months, working an hour a day, we had this online business that was making much more money. From there, we launched all these other little microsites, EnglishLessonsOnline.com, all the rest of it. And yeah, we decided a year later, look, this is so much more less work, so much more money. Let's sell the schools. It took us about two years to sell the schools. Mm -hmm. And then we merged all those online businesses under the name LiveLingua.com. And now we're one of the top online language schools in the world. And we're the only one who has started without any venture money. All of our competitors have, oh you know, gosh, the big banks and venture capital money behind them. We're the only bootstrap one in the top ranking in the online language field. That's really cool. Congrats on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we're really happy about it. And we're still working at it. We're, we, we still have to be scrappy, right? Because right? literally, when your competition has $20 million, you're sitting there like, yeah, what can we do? Yeah, we don't have 20 million. You know, we're doing pretty well, but we don't have $20 million yeah. just sitting there just to throw it a problem. If we did, I'd probably be retired. I mean, if I had $20 million in the bank account, I wouldn't throw it at a problem. I would retire yeah. and do just something else. I mean, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. What, what is something that you found that now still being scrappy and having those roots of being scrappy has let you stay ahead of maybe some of these bigger, maybe even slower moving places that do have mm -hmm. a lot of money to throw at something. Is there something you can think of that people could yeah, go? Yeah, oh, definitely. And this is, yeah, that's it. And this is, I think with a lot of people who are starting businesses and I don't, even in the, in the writing field is we can, you person, I can personalize it a lot more, right? We focus more on, we don't need as much either. If you're, if you right. got $20 million of investment, your investors are looking for you to grow 20% every month, get right. 10,000 new students, whatever it is. We don't need that. We're a very small team of eight full-time people. Not count, that's not counting the teachers, but eight full-time staff, including my wife and I, who count as the, part of those eight. We're doing well enough that we don't need to grow every year. In right. fact, there's some years where we say, this is pretty good. I mean, yeah. you know, Let's do you really need to grow. Sword fighting. You know? Sword fighting. Exactly. And the, I mean, I launched a marketing agency this year. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is actually going to be taking over full time 
once our son is older than five weeks old as the CEO of the company and running, you know, running that full time. And I'll just kind of be consulting as the marketing side of things at our business. But you need to think about why you're building a business. And our why was not to build the next Facebook. It was to build a business that could support our family, our staff, and hopefully contribute to the world. We sponsor 10 children through Save the Children, all sponsored by Live Lingua. And every chunk of students we get, once we get like 100 new students, we sponsor somebody else. So our goal is to get maybe one day to 100 children. We would be sponsoring through Save the Children. And then, you know, not necessarily have to worry about money. We have a very simple lifestyle. We live in Mexico. Trust me, our cost of living down here is a fraction of what, you know, European American people have. Mm -hmm. And we're good. I mean, you know, I have all the free time I need. I so that. that's the main, the answer to your main question. The whole personalized attention is what we have. Yeah. But the other advantage, I think the advantage of us not needing to grow is one that a lot of people overlook. They look at it like a business, you grow, grow, grow just for the sake of growth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you're happy where you are, I don't know if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year, were you really that much happier making 120? Right. If it, if it took twice as much work to make 120, would you be twice? Right. Be worth it. So you got to have to find that right point for you wherever you are in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, it seems too in the in this day and age where everything's getting so automated, everything's getting so big, everything, it people are craving that personalization. So that alone, having the right mindset and perspective can help you to actually end up doing better. Because that's what people are wanting versus just that's throwing it. money at something. That's it. Know. Actually, I just heard it on NPR yesterday. Bookstores are making a comeback in the United yeah. States. Those like little niche corner shops where you used to go and read mm -hmm. books. Barnes and Nobles, you know, the big ones are going bankrupt. Right. People want that personalized thing where you can go in and you know the seller or the yeah. seller knows yeah. you. It's like, you know, a new book just came in that I know you would love because you, this is the kind of book that you read. We mm -hmm. offer that kind of thing in language lessons at Live Lingua. We know who you are as a student. We don't have 50 million students. You're not a number. We know who you are. Right. You know who your past te teachers are. We kind of help pair you with your teachers. And I think anybody who's trying to get into the space right now, whether any kind of online business, that's a great way to find your niche. Personalize it. Um, don't try to get a million students. Try to get 100 right. students that are perfect for you. And take care of the ones that you have, because almost that's what you did too, by kind of stumbling into the online is like, you were like, well, how can we serve the past clients that we had by mm -hmm. offering them another service, which was the Skype lessons online. And that led to a whole nother vein versus just, I don't know. Yeah. Starting from scratch. <laughs> Honestly, all of my businesses, even the marketing company, the infinite upcycle that I've launched yeah. now, there's a logical progression there. It is not that I just sat down, kind of stared at the ceiling for 15 minutes. I'm like, what would be a good business idea? Yeah. The marketing agency I launched came up, you know, the story is, okay, we had a brick and mortar school, which, le you know, led to Live Lingua. And in order to compete, we had to come up with an online marketing strategy. And since, again, we're bootstrapping, so I don't have millions of dollars to throw pay Google for ads and all right. the rest of it. I needed something efficient. So over the course of the next five years, we got $4 million unique visitors to our website last year, just to give a perspective. So over the next five years, I started developing systems that I could do because it was only me that were time efficient. And I've been doing those now for years. I do have a small team that helps me internally in live language for years. About a year ago, I gave a talk about that system at a small conference, assuming that everybody else in the world knew exactly what it, you know, everybody else <laughs> is doing this. Why would anybody care? But I just, I honestly hadn't prepared very well for the conference and I just had to talk about something. So I talked about it and I was shocked to find that half the people in that room came up to me and asked me to do it for them. Mm -hmm. And that's why we launched this content amplification agency, but it was just the logical step, you know, progression in the business. So I'm not like a, those entrepreneurs who just come out of like Steve jobs inventing something out of the blue that nobody's right. heard of before. No, you just have to pay attention to what people are asking for and provide it and provide it well. I love that. And so that's infinite upcycle. So how'd you come up with the name? I like that. Cause it makes me think like, Oh, forever it will constantly be growing and i maybe don't have to be the one that's always pushing it forward exactly exactly and that's what we that's the concept behind the infinite upcycle we you know we either take people who've created the content and we amplify it across social media seo emails all the rest of it for you or we create the con you know help work with you to create mm. the content to do all that work <laughs> just like live lingua the name Infinite Upcycle, I will give full credit to my partner, JC Spears. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm told, I think I said at the beginning, I'm, my specialty seems to be helping build businesses around people, not necessarily building the business myself, if that makes yeah. any sense. So like my wife was the, the, the teacher, the, she's an amazing teacher. 
she's one of those people at five years old. She was playing. She was the teacher in front of her dolls and everybody mm-hmm. knew she was going to be a teacher. Um, my <laughs> partner here, JC, he's an amazing marketer. And I just helped build the businesses around them. So the Infinite Upcycle, 100% his. He came up with that. I will not take any credit for that name. Um, <laughs> that's a cool name. I like it. it is, yeah, no, I love. He said it, and I'm like, that's it. We got it. We're <laughs> definitely going to go with that. One little caveat I put in for names for anybody else in there who's listening, who's looking to start a business, don't get too stuck up on it. Whenever I do coaching for some of my, you know, people starting businesses, they get stuck on finding the perfect name. I assure you, Nike is not Nike because it chose Nike as the name. Right. I mean, you know, you, it could have been called, you know, ABC incorporated and right. it would still be successful because it's the business that makes it successful not the name the name recognition comes afterwards so pick your business and if you're online you can change it three years down the road you yeah. buy another domain name you point your old Redirect website at everything it. yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so don't get stuck up or caught up on your name just pick a name and start your business no that's really great advice because i I think a lot about names and people ask me a lot about names because it was all about like copywriting and, and words mm-hmm. and it can be really tough, but it's great to know one, you can change it Two, it's kind of like no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care, that sort of phrase. It's exactly. like no one cares about the name of your business. They care about the results you're going to get for them or how you're going to make them feel in doing the interaction. So focus more on that and less on the name. Just pick something exactly. and go. <laughs> and the name might come naturally. Another name will come a few years down the road because everybody might re- repeat a phrase to you like a hundred right. times. And like, that's it. We're changing that's our true. name to that. That's true. I love that. So what are some of the pillars of content amplification that you do for your clients? And that was a part of your system Mm -hmm. that you thought everyone already knew. (laughs) Yeah. Again, it's my ignorance in that. Um, And also (laughs) part of the reason is I'm kind of an introvert. So I was, you know, building all these businesses in my little cave in my Uh house. I mean, I, I, Literally, I tell people I built businesses in my Superman pajamas, and I do have Superman pajamas around <laughs> somewhere, and I have worked in Prove those. it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I'll go pick up. I was going to say. Um, <laughs> so the four pillars of content amplification, the main overarching tenant is to make it as efficient as possible. Because, again, we are keep, – keep in mind, I know that people are busy – that's why I developed the system because I was busy. I didn't have the time. So the four main steps are the following. The first – is research. So what we do is we have a formula and you can go to infiniteupcycle.com. I share all of this. There's no like proprietary information that I'm not sharing with you guys. You know, yeah. it's, it's I, just, I, it's a good I, amount of work. I heard on another interview did that you're, you guys are doing regular webinars where people can come and you will literally teach them everything. 100% AMA is free. We, exactly yeah. 100% for mm-hmm. free. We will show you how to do this. We want you to start building your business this way. Obviously, there is a side for us because this is a lot of work. So as soon as you can afford somebody else to do it, I know from experience. Right. You'll want so many, hopefully you'll think of us. Exactly. But I I want you to be successful. I want you to build your business, whatever, you know, if you're writing a book and you're amplifying it, if you have a blog and you want that, Mm -hmm. this will work for podcasts. This will work for everything. So step number one is keyword and competitor research. And we have a formula over there that we will share with you. But essentially, you got to figure out how many people are looking for the keyword and how hard it would be for you to rank for it. With the third category we have in there is how many people link to similar content because that's going to help you in one of the stages out there. So there's free tools you can use to get all this information and you compile it. One of the biggest mistakes we find people who are content creators make is I don't want to bat down the whole follow your passion thing is, but it's their passion. So what they do is they just write about what stuff they're interested in. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily what anybody else is interested in. Check first. It might be. I mean, for all I know, whatever you're writing about might be a passion for that. But make sure that there is, even in your niche, 100 people looking for it. And you can look that up before you do it. Check if anybody else has written something. You have to be honest with yourself. This is all part of the formula process. Mm -hmm. If you go out there and somebody's already written a 100,000 word article with images, videos, and podcasts related to it, you have to be honest with yourself. Do you have the time and resources to do something better than what's out there? If you Mm -hmm. don't, Come Make up a with another keyword. Right. Yeah. Make it exact. Pick a different keyword. It could be in the same realm. Don't give up on your whole idea. Right. Just kind of go in a slightly different direction to start off. Maybe one day you'll have resources to be able to write that hundred thousand word article and go out there. Right, right. So that's pillar number one. Make sure that you go out there and do the research to make sure that people are looking for what you're writing or what you're creating, and that they can, and then you can rank for what you want. Pillar number two, obviously, is creating great content. And for the listeners here, that's not something that I'm sure that's something they hear from you all the time, right? (laughs) I mean, it's it's when I say content, we generally write articles for our clients, but you content is podcasting, content is YouTube videos. Just make sure you do it well. And by well, I don't necessarily mean if you're doing a video that the lighting has to be perfect. It's just the way you present is clear, and you know the you engage with your audience. 
a lot of people get, get stuck up on the technical side of when people say do it well and not so much about what they're delivering in the content. Make sure the podcast is interesting. Make sure the video is interesting. Don't worry if the lighting on the video is a little off or, you know, your hair, you have a little hair sticking out of one, a little thing, which always happens. To me. I know. Um, so, so I'm like, me today. Lots I'm like, of gel. Well, lots of gel. I'm like, you know. Well, um, on the note with create good content, I would love your to dive in a little deeper too. Because sometimes it feels like, well, great in air quotes is subjective. So what's great to one person might not be great to other. From your experience, what else constitutes great content, particularly in the written version. Exactly. The first thing is, and what we do with our client is, you have to find you what your voice is before you write any piece of content. And that's one of the more difficult things when you're writing content. A lot of people are afraid to put themselves into their content, mm. whether themselves as a business or whether themselves as an individual. It doesn't matter. They want it. And that ends up leading to very dry and stale content because you don't want to offend anybody. So you don't say anything that you don't even include your opinions, right? Because mm -hmm. any opinion can be controversial. Mm -hmm. Apple pie is the best pie. Oh, somebody's going to disagree with me there. So I better not mention that. And I might just say pies are good. I mean, you know, which is just totally boring as a piece of content, right? I mean, at least mm -hmm. express some opinion. So you really need to know yourself first and then write some content that is around that. Mm -hmm. We find that that's the base for creating any great piece of content is that there is a point to it. You need to, you know, your personality is included and you have, you know what you're trying to say in that content. Again, I'm writing for the blog space. So mm -hmm. if you're trying to provide information and training, know that beforehand so that the blog is written around that and then put your voice into it. That'll make it unique. There's only one you that's out there. Afterwards, the key, honestly, is a good editor. Um, I'll be honest. <laughs> you can have great personality. You can have the goal. But if you have a spelling mistakes, yeah. the, the, the spacing is off, you know, it just, you have mm -hmm. run on sentences, all the rest of it, then no matter what you do, it's just not going to show in what you write. So those tend to be the three keys. And the final one, obviously, is practice. Um, yeah. If you've already written a thousand times, you know, a thousand articles, this will be easier for you. If you're just starting off, I promise you, you will be embarrassed by the first piece of content you create. Maybe not when you write it, but you go and, re go and read it again like a back. year or two later. Exactly. And you'll be like, wow. At the time, you'll probably think it's amazing. I know this from personal experience. I'm like, this is the greatest article ever written. And then I read it again two years later. I'm like, wow, I don't know what I was thinking and why I thought that was good. That was <laughs> awful. Um, you know, but you have to start. The only mm -hmm. way you're going to improve is by doing it. So yeah. I don't know if that gives you a super clear direction because it depends yeah. on industry. You know, we've written content from people who sell mannequins to people who sell, you know, who want to teach you bass fishing. So the really <laughs> what's in there is very different, but you, it's personality, direction, and a good editor. Well, it's interesting that you, that you said that in particular, the put yourself into your writing, because that was something that I was going to ask you about in my research before this interview was you share a lot of personal information on your website and you ask really fascinating, interesting, personal questions on your podcast, of which I had the honor of being on. And you asked me stuff that was just like, whoa, I've never been asked that ever in my entire life. And it really made me pause and think. And so I was going to ask you psychologically, and maybe you've already kind of answered it, but we're going to talk about it a little bit deeper. What do you think are the benefits of really revealing that you love sharp cheddar cheese on your apple pie. I read yeah, that, that on your really website. Good. Yeah, <laughs> Now my mouth's watering. I haven't had lunch today. That I would be know. really, really good right now. I, I literally wrote that down on my little notes. <laughs> your favorite color is blue. Mine is green, yeah. by the way, but blue is second. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. so why do you share that? Because I think that sometimes people run away from that because they're like, oh, who cares? No one's going to care. But we do. You do. And, and this goes back to the way I built my businesses and we, what we were talking about earlier. It's the personalized attention. I think too many people when they're starting off are trying to please everybody. Yeah. So you can't Guilty. say my favorite color is blue because the people who are favorite color is red are not going to read my blog. Right. <laughs> That's fine. How many people do you need to read your blog? All the people who like blue. How many people out there like cheddar cheese on their apple pie? I have no idea, but Maybe I've a few thousand. never tried it, but I'm like, and I'm vegan now, but I'm like, I might cheat a little bit just to try it. <laughs> I love cheese. But, you know, if you, the, the concept I actually give there is, you know, there's a reason why they give wasabi with the sushi is to clean your palate. And that's actually the reason I do it with the apple pie, because when you're mm -hmm. eating something really, really sweet, after a while, you get to that point where your uh -huh. whole mouth just tastes like sugar. Have a really sharp, salty cheddar cheese, and that'll just totally clean your palate. And then the next white, the next bite of the apple pie, you'll actually taste the apple pie. I was imagining you're melting it on top of the pie. 
So no, no, no. Separate. It's just a, I literally get a big chunk of cheese and oh. I just bite into it on the side over there. But that's oh, it's to okay. clean my palate. It kind of gives this contrast <laughs> when you're in there. So for anybody who wants to try it out, get, definitely give it a try. But it, I'll be honest, it's tradition in my family. There's an apple pie recipe that's been passed down from the – I'm a quarter German, so my grandmother's grim. Um, and there's this apple pie family recipe that's been passed down to generations, but it's only passed to the women in the family because the men like apple pie so much that if we knew how to make it, we'd all be severely overweight because we make it all the time. So they ration it out. They only give it to us on our birthdays and our Christmas and all the rest of it. And cheddar cheese has just always been what we've Mm -hmm. put on the side of that. So I really, really like that. That's cool. Well, yeah. So personalization, Mm -hmm. connecting, recognizing both in reality and even data wise with SEO and all these things, you don't have to connect with every single person on the entire planet to have a successful business to communicate and find your tribe. So it's all about just sharing who you really are and the right people will find you. Exactly. Exactly. And I think because most people do not want to build that next Facebook. You only need to have, yeah, mm-hmm. please everybody if you built, want to build one of those. And I assure you, Facebook and Google are not pleasing everybody right now either. Yeah. So you, you will fail. If you try to please everybody, you will fail no matter how big you want to get. For most of us, if we had a, 100 clients, 1,000 clients, that's all we need. You don't think there's 1,000 people in the world who put cheddar cheese on their apple pie, right. who <laughs> at least have some kind of relationship to sword fighting. When I was a kid, I remember I was a geek as a kid. I mean, I was, you know, the last guy picked for the PE, you know, PE. I'm the typical, you know, half Asian guy with the big glasses who, <sighs> you know, the eyes looked a little bit bigger behind the glasses because uh-huh. we couldn't afford the, the thinner frames. And I was embarrassed by a lot of these things as a kid. You know, I was like, oh, I wish I was more athletic and I wish I was cooler and all the rest mm-hmm. of it. Yeah, you get to my age. I'm like, I really don't care if people yeah. know I'm a geek anymore. I'm like, I'm yeah. a geek. Proud if nerd. I don't, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a nerd. I don't, I don't really care if people, you know, because we're in a world where we don't have to yeah. hang out with, with, there's a downside to it. We don't have to hang out with people that we don't like. Now, we have that causing us to be a little more polarized, right? Because right. we don't interact right. with that many people. But in a way, that also allows us to really express ourselves a little more freely than we had to in the past because we're not quite as limited to mm. it's not high school right where i go to this i have the same 30 right. people every single day whether i fit in or not i have to hang out with these 30 people right. when you're an adult you would never hang out with the people you didn't like i mean you know mm. on, a, on a day-to-day basis you work with them but you're not going to spend your free time with them awesome. and the same thing should be in your business build your business around the kind of people the customers you want to have when you write a book write it for the kind of people you want to you want to read it you know you don't write a book in my case, a science fiction fantasy novel for the people who only read, you know, history or, you know, mm-hmm. biographies. Don't try yeah. to write a book for them. Write a book for the people who are trying to read your book. Yeah, that I want to just underscore that because that is something I talk with my students and clients all the time with books, too, is because they sometimes feel like they have this pressure when it comes to books, like it needs to be a New York Times bestselling book and Oprah needs to call me and it needs to like reach a billion people. And it's like, okay. You might get there. I'm not going to discourage you, but let's just say who are the people you're actually trying to help with your current level of experiences and lessons? Let's just write something to help them. And even if you sell 20 copies to 20 people who really need it, you did something good Mm -hmm. and you never know where those relationships could go. So it can just completely snowball in a way you can't anticipate, but let's not worry about trying to please everyone and, you know, be this massive overnight success. Let's just try to help the people you can truly help. I think too many people right now are writing um, teen vampire trilogy novels. I'm like, I look on my Amazon, I'm like, how many of these things are there? I'm like, this is crazy. So yeah, because they're trying to please everybody. It's the fashion there, you know, everybody seems to be writing those novels. And then they become vanilla. It is. No, that's why I look at it now and I'm like, who isn't writing a teen (sighs) romance triangle vampire werewolf novel these days? I'm like, it's crazy. So yeah, that's the that's the key of the whole, you know, the second pillar, which is the writing right. and all of that. So number one, research. Number two, create great content. What's number three? Amplify across social media. So what mm. a lot of people do is they write this great piece of content or create this great piece of content and they let it sit there. But great pieces of content can be repurposed in so many ways. And there are a lot of people who kind of preach this. Gary Vee talks about this as well. As I said, I haven't come up with any of these methods. What we do at the Infinite Upcycle, and we even share the spreadsheets and worksheets with you guys, is we make it more efficient so that you're not doing a step in part of step one and wasting that work in step three, right? That you're yes. actually doing part of the work in step three. So what we do is out of each article that we write, usually 2,500 2, word article minimum, every 250 words, you're able to extract one great quote, question, 
piece of data. You know, if this is a more technical article, piece of data, you should be able to do that. You can use free pieces of software out there like canva.com mm-hmm. and you can create what we call a creative around that, which is an image, which generally has a t- piece of text on it. The quote, the statistic, something like that. You put it in Canva and in Canva, it'll allow you to resize it for all of the social media platforms that are out there. So pretty easily you're able to do this. So what you do with that is twofold. First, first off, you can now have posts for social media across across the board, right? So we post on a different level in different social media because you don't post as much on LinkedIn. If you post as much as people post on Twitter on LinkedIn, LinkedIn would kick you out. I mean, I don't know <laughs> if that's true, but I mean, literally Let's everybody would, it. yeah, exactly. You know, 15 times a day, people would just be like, well, what is this guy doing? Um, but on Pinterest, if you post 15 times a day, nobody will bat an eye. So there's a different level there. We share that. We have an article about that as well for optimum levels on all the social media posts on the infinite upcycle. And you take all these creatives and again, we're all about optimizing here. So I recommend either if you're starting off the software called Mm buffer.com, you just go in there and you pre-schedule it. You know, we're literally three months in advance for some of our content. I schedule in there. I'm going to sit back and my pod, my article will go live and all the social media is going to go out of the optimum times and the optimum days. If you have more money, you can use something like Hootsuite to do the same thing. That way, this one piece of content that you wrote, instead of just going on Facebook and sharing the actual blog post, you've now created all these unique, interesting pieces of content around something you already spent a lot of time on anyway. So you're making the most of it. What you also do is you reverse it then and you take all those images and you insert it back into the article that you wrote because They've done studies that if you mm-hmm. go to a full page full of text and it's nothing but text, people will just stop reading. That's so you, 100% true of me. I won't read it. Of course, because you're like, whoa, this is really intense. So every 250 words, as a general rule of thumb, you take that image that's relevant to that section that you've already created and insert it back into your into your article. That. So yeah. you go there. There's two, there's two great sides to that. First off, it makes it a lot easier to read, as Laura is mentioning, right? But it's just easier on the eye. So that's not mm-hmm. just this big wall of text. Secondly, from the marketing point of view, if somebody just saw an, you know, one of those posts on Facebook and they click on it and they go to the article and they see the same image, it sends a message to our mind that you're in the right place. Mm. You know, I just clicked yes. on an image of this. But if you, you know, went to one place and there was an image of an airplane and you went to the article and the first image you saw was of, you know, a cat. A cat. Exactly. <laughs> you're like, did I come to the right place? Right. I mean, you know, your mind does this kind of has this disconnect. So you're creating this connect in the, you know, between the social media accounts and your article or your content there. And that takes the engagement and the chance of people sharing and reading your article takes it way, way up in our studies. That's really smart. So I that's the that. third the third one is the amplification of the content by creating all of these creatives. And then on the images that you put in your blog, you can put the right keywords in your alt tags and then there help you with go. your search ranking. And, and people will spend longer. They'll share the images. I mean, again, it's about ampli- yeah. content amplification. So this will be amplified out. People will share not through face. People might come in through Twitter and then share an image that they like on Facebook through your mm-hmm. website. So you need to make that very easy for them and make sure the social share buttons on the images in your article as well. So they can share it all out there. Not only share your article, but share individual parts of your article out. Retweet, uh, you know, mm-hmm. put it on their board at Pinterest, yes. share it on Instagram. All of these things that they, they'll be able to do. And you're doing all of that all at the same time while amplifying your content out there. So that's step three in our content amplification process, the infinite upcycle. I love that. So what is step four? Step four is a step that a lot of people don't do as well. Um, just to give a basic background for search engine optimization, that's about ranking your website or your article in Google for specific keywords. Remember what we did in step one? We already actually took a look at the keywords that people are looking for. So when you wrote this article, you kind of knew what you were going for. So what we do at that point is something called the skyscraper method. Mm -hmm. You've already done all this research, right? So you already know how many people are looking for it, all the rest of it. You've already checked the competition. So what we do next is we go to the competition. In our case, we go to the top 50 results for the keyword. Uh, let me just say Spanish lessons online because I know the language mm-hmm. area pretty well. Get the top 50 results and using a tool either like Uber suggests, which is free or Ahrefs, which is paid, but gives you a little bit better data. You can figure out who has linked back to the top 50 results in Google for Spanish lessons online. Not who are in the top 50 results, but who, have, who has liked those results so much that they went on their own page and they gave a link to it, either wrote an article about it or, you know, just linked to it organically. Using tools like Ahrefs, you can go, then you can go to all of those pages and you can find out the emails of these people. Hmm. And you can email them saying, Hey, look, 
I know that you expressed interest in this Spanish article in the past. We've gone out there, we've written something new. So let's say it was the best Spanish tools of 2017 that they linked to, but like it's 2020. I just created this 2021. Hey, would you be interested in sharing this with your audience? Two to 4% in our experience will say yes. They'll say, yeah, I'd love to share this with my audience. But it's not only that. So there's the way that you phrase the email should not be just ask for, give me a link. Because Mm -hmm. trust me, anybody who's got a page of any kind of authority, I'm sure, Laura, you get them all the time. It's like, give me a link on your page. Give me a link on your page. No, you're not going to do that. So just let them know. Ask ask them some feedback. How can I make this article better? What can I make it good? You know, what can we do to make it good for your audience? And if they give you feedback, you start a conversation with them. You Mm -hmm. can take some of that feedback. You put it back into the article. And you're building a relationship with somebody who's probably also in your area there. So this is not only about link building. Through this process, I've been interviewed in Chile and Italy on newspapers because I reached out to these people with this process. They saw it. They said, hey, we can't give you a link in that article. That's an older article. Uh Um, But I'd love to interview you. Yeah, I'll do a new one. Would you be willing to interview interview for a new article? Amazing. I've appeared on podcasts because they say that was a link on an old podcast episode. I can't add it there, but would you like to come on my podcast and we can talk about it? You can you know, obviously I'll link back to your business this way. And I've had relationships That's with, awesome. you know, I've met people on emails and then I met them at conferences afterwards because we had started having this conversation. So that final pillar is this kind of email outreach mm-hmm. with goal number one of getting links, but not the only goal. It's building relationships with people in your industry. So those are the four pillars of the content amplification cycle. There is a fifth extra pillar for those who have time. Yeah. And that is you can re now Think about it. Now you've just created all this amazing content that's out there. You have images, you have blog posts, you have relationships with people in the industry. This only this opportunity, of the reason I don't mention it all the time is the pillar number five becomes apparent after about six months or a year. So it's not like in month one, you're going to have mm. this access. But now your creativity is the limit. I now have thousands. I've been doing this every week for a year. So I have 40 images and creatives every week for a year. I have hundreds of creatives. Put them together for an ebook. We did this when we did tongue twisters for Spanish. We put out tongue twisters every month for a year, and then we had an ebook for 50, 54 Spanish that. tongue twisters. You could, you know, we had articles written about it as well. The text is done. So we, all we had to do was get somebody who did the layout of our ebook, and the ebook was done. Mm. You can find the best 10 articles you've written on a subject. You already have the images as well. Put them all together, put a pre, you know, preface on it. You have a little book as well. Mm. Going to the next level, you know, Laura, what you preach. You've been doing this for three or four years. You have a book. Yeah. You have images. You have articles. You've researched it. You know people like this stuff because you you knew that yes. before, the day you started because you did the research beforehand. Mm. You're taking your 20 best articles based on links, based on shares, based on reads. You put them together, do a little bit of work. And I'm sure, Laura, you can speak much better to me how to <laughs> connect all of those. And you have a book, a real book, like a published book out of all of this. The yes. content application doesn't end with our process. We just build you the base. From there, you can do anything you want. Build videos. You you just read your pot your, your article, then you just change your you know the images that you've created for the social media. On, mm-hmm. Put them on YouTube. So you're just kind of reading your article as the images flip by, and you have a video for YouTube huh. out of that as well. So I there's all that. these ways you can amplify this content out. That's pillar number five: is just be creative. Well, I love that, and it, this what you're talking about is definitely stuff that I have preached. And I have done to a certain degree in my business, but now having a baby, so yours is five weeks, mine is five months, so Uh not much older. I'm just like, wow, I have to get on my game even better to really plan out in in advance what I'm going to do and batch my work and Mm -hmm. think of how to repurpose stuff. Like I have to go to the next level just because my time is more limited. I Obviously, I should have done it before anyway because it's really smart, but it's one of those things that you're like, oh, I'll I'll get even more efficient next (laughs) month. And then it's like... A year later, like, wait, I'm still at home. What am I doing? Yeah, so, I think efficiency goes down in life, not necessarily up as much as much <laughs> yeah. as we expect. So yeah. I know, right? So now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like this is what I've been planning to sit down and plan for the rest of the year and beyond. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, this is a good reminder. Like I need to get this done. But I love it too, because I was more thinking, I'm just gonna sit down and brainstorm all the things that I know people have asked me or I think that are important or I teach in my course and I can and teach on those. But I could do even better to go to your first step and actually research and see mm-hmm. what are people looking for and even the phraseology that people are using to search That's for. That's the difference. Um there's yeah. a big, for example, I'll use like Spanish tutor versus Spanish tutors with an S. Mm-hmm. Spanish tutor has three times as much search as Spanish tutors with an S. And Google's eyes and the results will be different when you look in Google. That little change yeah. 
can make a huge difference in your business. Now, not everybody, you know, if Laura, in your case, I would definitely recommend go through the list of stuff as your starting point and then run that through the key, mm-hmm. you know, the keyword mm-hmm. research. For a lot of people who are starting off their business, they don't have right. a few years of people, what questions that people ask. So they can do this from scratch. It's a little more time consuming, but, you know, start by looking for stuff, that w- what you would look for. Right. And Google will give you recommendations of, you might also like these search results. So you copy and paste those and you start with those. From those, they generate 10 more search results you might be interested in. And then it kind of leads you down this rabbit hole. Don't get stuck there too long because you can do this for months. You know, yeah, if you're creating yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you, for a year and you want to publish every week, you need 54 pieces of content. So you run them through our formula. When you get 54 that score high enough based on our formula that says, mm-hmm. okay, that's worth your time, done. Don't keep going. I mean, maybe you, you can do two years, but don't do 20 <laughs> years worth of content out there, right? People will <laughs> Things change will change that. by then. Things yeah. will change a lot, exactly. So just do one year and then start working on it. I love that. Now, a question I wanted to ask you, jumping back into step four, I think it was when reaching out to getting people to link back to your article. I love for more tidbits on tips around the email that you send to people because I have gotten requests from people for linking to their articles or to their website or whatever. And there are some I don't even finish reading and I delete and I put in spam. And there are some that get through. I click, I look at it and I say yes. So it's like, what are some of those things that you found that help get people to actually open it, read it Mm -hmm. and say yes? That's a great question. And the answer is going to be the same as a lot of the other parts personalized. Mm, yeah. That's it. Personalized. <laughs> but there's two levels of personalization. Generally, when we do the outreach, we break our emails into two groups. And I'm sorry to say it, but you know, those who are like much more influential, we write a custom email to them. But sometimes in our research, we'll get like a thousand link emails back. Sorry, we can't customize a thousand different emails for these people, especially people who have maybe have a personal blog mm. that we're reaching out to and trying to get the email from. So what we do there is what I recommend for For that top one, you personalize it. Go and read their website, kind of reach out to them and really try to connect with them. If it's for everybody else, personalize it towards you, not outwardly, personalize it inwardly. So if you're sending out this email, and I use this a lot, I start by saying, hey, I'm Ray. I'm honest. I don't say, I read your website and I loved it, which is what all of these other like generic ones say. Mm -hmm. Trust, I know you didn't read my website. Mm -hmm. You've never, you don't even know who I am. I'm like, look, I know you're interested in this topic before. My name's Ray. If you want to know more about me, I've included that at the end of this email. I have a link to my LinkedIn so you can see I'm a real person. So, you know, you go to my LinkedIn profile, it'll tell you what I do. Just as a tip, I'm a semi-professional sword fighter. I kind of, I throw that in there. So it's like like (laughs) put some quirk about you that's there, that's real at the beginning. And then you go into the pitch, which is, you know, hey, look, I know you've been interested in this. I created this piece of content. Take a look. Remember the first email, I don't even, I don't necessarily ask for a link. I say, hey, let me know what you think about it. How can I make it better? And at the end, I say, if you'd like to share it on your website or across your social media, I'm okay if they don't share it on their website, but they have 10,000 followers on you know, Instagram and they share it on Instagram. Yeah. To me, that's a win, right? For the email mm-hmm. outreach. It's not what I was asking for, but that's, so I, I leave that at the end. But I also want to get the feedback from them. I want to start a relationship. They might never, they give feedback. I make changes sometimes. They never put that in there, but now I know who they are. They know who I am and who knows what kind of relationship that's going to build down the road. So personalize it. And finally, keep it short. Do not write a 20 page yeah. essay. Nobody's going to read that. It's true. Three lines to get your point across. Here's my article. And maybe at the end, I, you know, a thank you. And I, I'm a big fan and no, nobody else seems to, not that many people do it, of PS in my emails. Nobody uses postscript in there. You know, it's like that is the, you used to have to do their in. I always put PS at the end of it. And that's where I put like, here's who's, here's my information. Here's the link to my LinkedIn. Mm. You know how I own a, I used to own a chocolate factory in the Philippines. I do sword fighting, all the rest what? of it. I didn't know the chocolate factory. Oh yeah. For like six years, I owned a chocolate. I sold my stock there. I was a co-founder and then I just sold my stock there about a year ago now to my oh, partner. Funny. She bought me out. I don't even like chocolate. I'm a gummy bear person myself, but my wife does. Gummy so bear. Very... Exactly. That's I, you say in German. Honey bows. Yeah. Honey bows are my Hattie favorite. Hattie, I love honey bows. But yes, so that's how you personalize the more automatic emails. Personalize it towards you. Not mm. you. You can't personalize it towards everybody you're re- emailing it, but make it about you. If you're going to be writing for for a business, make sure that you have a face of the business that's doing this outreach. So you know, personalize it to that person. You, it's very, you can't personalize it to a business. Nobody cares. But if you say, hey, this is you know Joe from the VP of customer outreach. I love Black Labs. And blah, and then they go into, but Joe really does love Black Labs. Because yeah. really, if you get a response, you're going to be starting a conversation here. And if you made that up, 
it'll be obvious. They're like, yeah. hey, I responded because you love Black Labs. It's like, Black what? You know, right. like, and they're like, you, like, oh, my VA put that in. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why. That, that's totally yeah, made up. Like, yeah, okay, no, no. Then you lose them. You lose them at that point. Yeah. So make sure there's a person related to that outreach. I love that. That's good. Now, one last question that that uh, popped in my head as you're describing this. What's a realistic time frame for people to think, okay, I'm going to put in this work to build and grow and to start seeing the traffic grow to my site and start seeing some results? Because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I did this for two weeks and I'm not at the top <laughs> of Google. What's going on? Yeah. I would say, depending on this, uh, the varies on how competitive your field is. If you're looking to try to sell books, yeah, you're going up against Amazon. That's going to take a lot longer. But I would say, realistically for most well thought out businesses and with a, you know, within a niche one to three years, I'll mm-hmm. be honest, this is, mm-hmm. this is going to the gym is the way I describe it to a lot of our clients. You got to do it every week. It's going to the gym and eating right. Mm-hmm. It's going there every and week. Eating right. Damn. And both. both of them, exactly. <laughs> both of those things you got to go and you have to do it every week consistently. You have to do it well. If you do it over time and you miss a week, you know, you don't do this yeah. at Christmas, you're fine. You know, that's just like if you go home and you eat all the pies and turkey and you know, <laughs> Christmas, but you're exercising and eating well the rest of the year, you're fine. I mean, you're not, you're not going to have issues with this, but you need to consistently do it. This is not a 30 day get rich quick scheme. I mentioned that mm-hmm. we passed 4 million visits on my website last year through thanks to this. It took me eight years to get there. Mm-hmm. You know, small business with 4 million websites, unique yeah. visits. That's not so bad. There might be more out there, but you know there are other bigger sites out there. But four million for something run by my wife and I, owned by my wife and I, is not a bad thing. This will get you there. I've you know we've seen results for our clients along those lines as well. You'll see consistent growth over time. But we share again on the website. I share the live language traffic, and you know when I started the first year is like two thousand. The next year it got up to like six thousand, then twelve. It, it's been doubling consistently year on year. Mm-hmm. But if you would quit on year one at 2,000 or year two at 6,000, which is 600 visits a month or so, you would have been done. I mean, that's not that much. It took me many, many years to get up to this level. But you can do it. It's time consuming. If you can't afford to hire a company like us to do it, you can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. But I don't know a way to start a business that doesn't take work. And I'll tell you, this is not the way to start your business. That, you know, this is not a hack to start your business. This yeah, is- and if you care about having a business for the long haul and not just like a, a quick scheme to make some cash, like in the next mm-hmm. three months, and you want this to be around for the long term, then it makes sense to invest the time and possibly money if you can to really get that snowball rolling downhill. <laughs> you in 10 years, you know, the reason I haven't written a book yet is because I, I joke that the only book I would know how to write is how to build a million com- dollar company in 10 years and nobody would buy it because nobody wants to hear that. It's like, you know, how to get six pack abs in a decade. I'm like, yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody would buy that book. Um, but a decade isn't that long. Right. If you're 25 right now and listening to this, do you want to have a million dollar company by the time you're 35? If you're 40, do you want to have a million dollar company by the time you're 50? Right. It's not right. that bad. I mean, you know, I guarantee to you, you're, if you're working at a nine to five job, they are not going to be giving you a raise to a million dollars in the next 10 years. That's true. You know, you're lucky at like 3% a year and that keeps up with inflation. You are right. not going to have that. This doesn't guarantee it. Nothing guarantees it. But this gives you a pretty consistent chance. Again, I go back to my gym and analogy. If you go to the gym every single day for the next 10 years, you might not be Arnold Schwarzenegger. If you're a guy, if you're a girl, hopefully you, you won't be in 100 <laughs> years. But let's just say, you know, you won't be Arnold Schwarzenegger. But will you be in better shape mm-hmm. and, you know, healthier? Yes, you will be. And the same thing for your business. Your business will be in better shape and healthier and more successful in 10 years doing this. Mileage might vary slightly, but the direction won't. Mm-hmm. And all the connections you're making. And th- there's all these other side benefits too beyond you just never know. money yeah. that like are coming. Actually, Entrepreneur Magazine, us winning, we were one of the top, you know, top small businesses was a result of this outreach because I did an outreach to one of the reporters unknowingly. Mm-hmm. You know, this was one of our standard emails and she got back to me. He's like, look, that article, I, you know, I can't change my article on there, but your, your business sounds really interesting. You should apply for this award that we have called the E360 award. So I did. And that was with 2015. We won one of the best small business in the United States as a result of this outreach, because I wouldn't even know that it existed unless I'd done this outreach. That's so cool. That's, that's a great, example to end on. I love that. Mm -hmm. And so people can go to infiniteupcycle.com to learn more, get even more training for free and learn about how to hire you if they're like, okay, I'm ready. Just take this off my plate. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And we'll even do it. We do a 30 minute like coaching consult call for free. It's not even a sales call. We're not going to, we, we don't, it's either me or my partner who do it and we will refuse to, you know, 
for you to, you're not allowed to sign up at the end of this 30 minute call. It is just there for us to answer your questions. After 30 minute call, after you have 24 hours, if you decide you want to come on, that's totally fine, but we will not pressure you. It's a 30 minute call to answer your questions. So you guys can go and just sign up for that three 30 minute consult there. Just sign up. We'll set it up and we'll just chat. That's amazing. And then let's see how else you're active on LinkedIn and Facebook primarily. Correct. Correct. So Raymond Blakeney. That's right. But Look there's for a, a sword fighting photo. That like yeah. I literally, they, I, I, I have that everywhere. I have me in a kendo uniform and all of them. So I'll stick out. I love that. And some cheddar cheese over the apple pie. That, I should do that. that. I'll be you know a sword in one hand, cheddar cheese and apple pie in another one. I love that. Well, <laughs> any uh, any other parting tips or anything I didn't ask about that maybe is bouncing around in your head just from what we were talking about to help people with applying psychology or writing tips to help their business. Don't be afraid to try. Mm. Don't be afraid to to quote unquote fail. I don't like using the word fail because fail to me is when you stop trying, not fail, not when you something doesn't work. But in this case, I'll say, don't be afraid to fail. Just write. You know, if you're writing, just write. If you have a business, start it. Too many people have business ideas that they never get off the ground. So try it and learn from it. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Ray. This has been great. And I can't wait to visit you in Mexico. I look forward to having you here, Laura. Thanks. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Bye. Amazing stuff. I loved breaking down content creation and amplification with Ray. And a big shout out to Ronsley Vaz, who introduced us. He is the founder of the We Are Podcast Conference. And he saw that we had so much in common, both former teachers, both love traveling, both podcasters, both nerds for lots of stuff when it comes to business. So appreciate the introduction. Make sure to connect with Ray on LinkedIn and Facebook. Tell him that you heard him on the Copy That Pops podcast. And also check out his websites at livelingua.com and infiniteupcycle.com where you'll be able to book a free no pressure call or jump on a live training to get more help implementing what you learned on this episode today. That is so valuable. Really take advantage of it. And I'll include links to everything that I mentioned in the show notes, which you can find at copythatpops.com forward slash podcast. And you can just search for Ray's name in that search bar if you want to find it or look in your podcast player for the show notes for this episode as you're listening and you'll be able to see the links in there as well. Hope you got a ton of valuable insights out of this episode and I'll look forward to speaking with you next time when we'll find more ways to write copy that pops. Thanks so much for listening. Let's keep the conversation going. You can find more at copythatpops.com and I'm at Laptop Laura on all the socials. Sometimes we find the greatest things in 